How the economy pans out uh, in the coming months would be a function of how the virus behaves in India. And it's very important to understand that seven states uh, where the virus is still playing havoc are actually the heart and soul of the commercial centers of India. And therefore, it's important to look at it from this perspective of both lives and livelihood. And I'll take you through a couple of slides on how in India has confronted uh, the battle of lives and how India should confront the battles of livelihood. And then uh, I'll open myself to some question answers from your end and I'll respond to some of them. Uh, so here are a few slides which will give you a perspective of how India has uh, faced this uh, challenge. So uh, if you were to look at the chronology of this, uh, within a time span of 10 days, uh, uh, actually, all these countries, USA, France, Germany, UK, India, and Italy had uh, the coronavirus cases. Uh, uh, and actually, Italy is, uh, re reported the first case a day after India. Uh, yet, India's trajectory has been very vastly different. One of the reasons, because, uh, you know, this virus grows by geometrical progression, and there is an exponential growth rate. And therefore, it was important to take some firm measures of locking down because, uh, uh, you know, if you were to flatten the curve, you get enough time for being able to ensure PPEs, ventilators, uh, COVID hospitals, etc. And that is what actually India has done uh, so that you get adequate time for all the states to prepare. Now, if you look at uh, uh, the share in global fatalities, actually, and uh, you look at this slide, uh, India's, uh, as of 4th May, India's fatalities were just around 1,400, whereas USA was around 68,602. And India's share is just about 0.6% of the global COVID-19 deaths. Now, uh, uh, despite reporting the first positive case a day after India, Italy has uh, witnessed a very high number, and you will see this very sharp curve of Italy. But India's, in India's case, uh, since uh, you know, in week four itself, Italy had experienced a 216 percent growth, whereas in our case, the rate has been rather uh, relatively constant. I'm showing this because it will give you a perspective of how uh, uh, it will give you a perspective of how we've performed. And uh, you know, uh, uh, in week 12, since the first recorded cases of each country, cases in USA were 39 times higher than India. Cases in France were about seven times higher, and cases in Italy were about 11 times higher than India. And actually, India's five-day moving average of total positive cases is the lowest in comparison to all these countries. Uh, we uh, reported, India reported it's actually its first death on 13th March. Uh, the total deaths in Italy by that time were already about 1,000. Uh, we reported about 166 deaths in week 10, while USA's uh, reported deaths were about 19 times more. So even if by five day moving average, the fatalities are the lowest in comparison to other countries. Now, uh, I wanted to just show you that growth in India of both daily and cumulative cases uh, have been consistently linear, they've been lower, and they've been non-exponential. And uh, actually, uh, on day 65 after the first case, US daily volume was about 25 times India's volume. Uh, now, uh, actually, uh, this is an Oxford University study which has shown that India's lockdown measures have been amongst the most stringent in the world. Now, uh, this was necessary because India is a very vast country of 1.3 billion and if we had allowed community infection to spread, it would have been very difficult. 
It's also important to say that many countries which tried to save their economy have neither been able to save lives nor their economy. And actually, both have got impacted. So strategically, it was very important to keep, uh, uh, you know, a, a very, very strong hold on uh, lives and stop community infection from spreading. And we took some very bold and timely decision in terms of air travel, in terms of inter-district travel, in terms of janta curfew, in terms of a lockdown. And uh, we contained the spread of the virus. And actually, uh, you know, I quite admit to the fact that India uh, has had amongst the stringent measures amongst all the countries. Uh, and actually, in the long run, this will pay us off as we go along. And even stringently, uh, you know, just look at USA where uh, they not they initially did not do a lockdown and states after states did their lockdown. And actually, uh, you look at this, uh, uh, the growth of cases in India has been very, very low as compared to uh, USA, both in terms of fatalities and in terms of overall cases. Now, if we... The lockdown effect of this, uh, we've tried to look at this and by on 25th April, uh, we examined this and if our, uh, we hadn't done a lockdown, then our total cases, which, which are, uh, would have been more than about 10 lakhs and the fatalities would have been about almost 15 times more in the absence of a lockdown. So even now we don't see an exponential trend. And one of the criticisms of India has been that we've had a very uh, low rate of uh, testing, uh, but we've increased the total number of testing from about uh, 1,400 now to close to about, uh, you know, we're doing about 75,000 and we'll soon reach about a lack of tests per day. But our positives actually, which were about 4.6% has actually come down to 3.4%. For four, from 4.7% to 3.4%. So the, we, we are largely doing very, very uh, uh, hot spot and symptomatic cases. And therefore, our percentage of positive should have been much, much higher, but remained at about 4.7, between 4.7 and 3.4%. It's at 3.4% now. France is at about 23%. Spain is at about 16%. And uh, U.S. is at about 17%. So overall, the spread of infection, our view is that even if you do more testing, much more testing, even if you reach about a lakh, you will find that the number of positives will still be low. We are right now doing about 75,000 tests per day. Uh, positive detection rate, rates are, are actually have fallen rather than going up. And, uh, you know, I'm uh, just showing you this mortality rate that uh, uh, our mortality rate is the lowest in the world. It's at about 3% as compared to 15% in UK. It's about, uh, you know, 14% in Italy. France is about 15%. But our mortality rates are the lowest. I also want to show you this because it's important to understand this because many people are very enthusiastic about economy. And I, so am I. I'm a great believer that we need to get our economy cracking and we need to get everything going. Uh, so I wanted to show you this position of states where uh, the percentage of their share is more than 1%. And uh, there are 17 states which have less than 1%. Uh, some states have 2 to 4%, 4 to 5%. But there are, five, there are seven states which have more than 5%. Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Delhi, Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat. So if you look at it, this is really the heart of India in terms of economic activity. That's Maharashtra, Gujarat, uh, Mumbai there, uh, Rajasthan, Tamil Nadu, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, more than 5%. And actually, the situation in Mumbai and Delhi, to my mind, is... Uh, is not so good right now even. So we need a very concentrated attack there. So these are seven states which need a very focused attention. Uh, I'm showing you this because actually if you look at Kerala, Kerala was able to flatten the rate. But if you look at weekly cases, uh, while Telangana has shown noticeable improvement uh, and Rajasthan and Tamil Nadu are doing relatively well, but Delhi, Gujarat, Maharashtra MP require very rigorous monitoring and containment. And there's a challenge there. 
so if you look at Kerala, that's flattened the curve totally, uh, totally flattened the curve. Uh, now Telangana is also flattening. Uh, some states, uh, there has been a one week fall, but you need to make it fall for about five to six weeks in a row, one after another. And this requires a very, very concentrated practice of isolation, contact testing and uh, uh, isolation and treatment. And uh, therefore, we are waiting to see this breakthrough happening in other states as well. There are uh, some districts uh, which have very high uh, level of high load districts, districts which contribute to more than 1%. And I just wanted to show you that actually uh, Mumbai, Delhi, Ahmedabad, Indore, uh, I'm treating Delhi as one district here. Uh, but Mumbai, Delhi, which are really the heart of commercial activity, uh, the situation is not good at all. And uh, Ahmedabad, Indore, Jaipur, Pune uh, are the other places where I've given you the contribution to national cases and the contribution to state cases. So uh, Marash, Mumbai is contributing to about almost 40% of Mumbai's cases and Ahmedabad is contributing to about almost 69%. So this is, uh, these six districts and five states need very, very aggressive containment and monitoring strategies. And uh, Hyderabad shows a declining trend here. Uh, but if you look at cases per million, uh, you will again see that I'm just taking you through some of this because to understand that uh, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Delhi are still showing very high cases per million and high load states show greater than national average in positive cases detected as a percentage of the total tests being conducted. And therefore, we need a very, uh, very, very strong uh, uh, this thing, but in some some states like Madhya Pradesh also need to ramp up their testing. And uh, Maharaj, Gujarat, Andhra Pradesh, and Delhi have actually been uh, doubling their rates uh, at much much uh, lower than the national average. So they are doubling really rapidly. Uh, now the southern states have shown a very high recovery rate, as you will see here. I'm just jumping through these slides because I want to come down to the main issues of the presentation. And, uh, you know, the challenge really would be about uh, uh, trying to find a vaccine. This is quite a quite some time away. This will take you more than uh, more than a year, at least. Uh, you know, Oxford University is doing work. There's a uh, company called Moderna, which is doing work. Uh, Gilead uh, is doing is doing fairly advanced work on this. And there are six Indian companies. Uh, which are working and I have uh, Zydus Cadilla, Bharat Biotech, Indian Immunologicals, Minvax, Serum uh, Institute and Biological E. I am mentioning their name and there are two more which have today claimed that they are also working. I am mentioning their name uh, because it is very important that India is able to find a vaccine from one of the Indian companies because that will enable us to provide uh, vaccines at low price points, at very low price points to Indians and that's critical. Because right now the only vaccine you have is uh, physical distancing. That's the only uh, vaccine you have. And without a vaccine, full-fledged economic activity, much as Mr. Sanjay Kirloska would wish, would be very, very difficult. I can assure you that. Uh, and therefore, uh, my view is on is that instead of looking at districts, we need to hyper localize, we need to aggressively contain and test in red zones, uh, make very, very, which, which provide for high case load states, uh, very closely monitor orange zones and open up green zones. Uh, we need to do more testing in some states. Uh, we need to continue with new norms. We con need to continue to save lives of people with comorbidity who are 60 plus and uh, save livelihoods. Uh, it, now, my belief is that we've done relatively well except in two or three major states. Uh, we've been able to save lives in a very big way because our percentage is still very low. And therefore, this opens up the possibility of uh, opening up your economy and we need to now that the government has, while it calls it lockdown three, in my view, it's opening up uh, 1.0 and it's opened up, it will take you another three or four more days to see how things pan out in the states because there's an element of fear and we need to get this 
element of fear out much as the, there was an element of fear after the 1928 great depression and this fear is there in the minds of all uh, civil servants it's in the mind of uh, businessmen it's in the mind of politicians we need to get this out to be able to get economic activity back again on the economic activity i would merely like to say that it'll be very difficult to get full economic activity back unless and until states do not open up the entire supply chain. It's not possible to open up a manufacturing unit till we don't open up the shops as well and allow supply chains to work. Now, <coughs> this would require a lot of discipline. This would require a lot of physical distancing. This would require a lot of distancing, uh, uh, discipline amongst Indians. We yesterday saw how Indians behaved when the liquor shops were open. And if we do not do this, then you will have a very, very poor situation of infection spreading in other areas and therefore Indians need to be here. Now, I personally have the view that as we move forward, uh, COVID-19 actually pandemic will provide an opportunity. Uh, you know, the status quo will change, the supply lines will change, the supply chain will break. And China, which for many years, uh, many decades has been the key supplier to the world. Uh, its state, its position will greatly get altered, and therefore we need to challenge the assumptions of business as usual. And India needs to take advantages of new opportunities. And my view is that uh, sooner or later the government will, and the government is working on a package. And I don't want to preempt this because this is the prerogative of the finance minister. Uh, the government will come out with a package. And this package should be accompanied by very serious structural reforms in the economy across sectors, across agriculture, across uh, you know public distribution, across manufacturing, across a whole range of areas. But the key there is that uh, India is a global manufacturing and exports. We have to convert India as a global manufacturing and export hub. Uh, I think digital payments. Uh, we should drive our financial inclusion. Uh, healthcare must become truly digital. This will be the age of cloud hospitals, tele and video cons consultation. And actually, through Aroke Setu, uh, we've demonstrated, we worked in private public partnership. We were able to create technologically a world class app within 10 days' time. And now, uh, again, then we work with some private sector companies and we created telemedicine, uh, a, a new app, uh, Arogya Setu Mitra, uh, which is a part of Arogya Setu now, and it drives uh, telemedicine. That was also driven within a period of just seven, eight days. And it's, all of this is world-class technology. And therefore, uh, we will, India will have to use technology to leapfrog. And there, I think, Artificial intelligence will have to take center stage. Uh, my view is that there will be several sectors which will see a whole new emerging areas of growth and disruption will be inevitable. And in these sectors, India must seize the opportunity to become a key player. And this would require actually size, scale and speed of action. And I just wanted to tell you that my view is that uh, the world of mobility will be in the midst of its biggest disruption. Uh, within this decade, we would transit from combustion vehicles, which have 2,000 parts, to a very shared, connected, and electric world. And electric vehicles will have just 20 parts, as you are all aware. There's a huge opportunity for India because USA already has over 900 cars per 1,000 persons, and Europe has over 800 cars per 1,000 persons. In contrast, in India per capita, ownership of vehicles is just 20 vehicles per thousand people. And therefore, India has a very, very unique opportunity to leapfrog ahead from the legacy model of individually owned combustion vehicles. Uh, I also feel that the cost of battery is falling very rapidly. It has fallen down from lithium ion battery prices have fallen from about $1,100 per kilowatt hour to about $175 per kilowatt hour. They'll fall further. 
the government has supported this movement by a lower GST tax structure, 5% as compared to 28%, 5% for electric vehicle as compared to 28% for combustion vehicles. We've given tax deduction on interest for loans and supported procurement through the fail through scheme. And therefore, uh, you know, in India, we have about 78% two-wheeler vehicles. But we've recently seen established players like Bajaj and TBS launching their electric vehicles. Uh, we've also seen the emergence of very innovative startups in EV ecosystem, Ather, Okinawa, Revolt, Talk. Uh, and therefore, uh, actually in two wheelers, we'll reach price parity with conventional combustion engine vehicles, uh, even on the initial cost of ownership in the next two to three years. So there will be a huge disruption and this is a massive opportunity for India to become the lowest global manufacturer of electric two-wheelers and three-wheelers. I think the second area which presents an enormous economic opportunity for India is the domestic manufacturing of lithium-ion batteries because uh, this is an electric vehicle's most expensive component and uh, you know, storage batteries are critical not only for electric vehicles, but for the spread of solar rooftops and renewable energy. Uh, the recent tenders which we've had for, uh, you know, solar plus energy tender storage, their average tariff has come to about 4 rupees, 4.4 and 4.30 per kilowatt hour. And these are the cheapest renewable plus energy bids in the world. And they, according to me, they demonstrate that the days of coal and Fossil fuel power are over, and therefore you will. There will be a huge opportunity. And actually, even if we were to import lithium and nickel, uh, India can do about 80 percent capture. It can capture about 80 percent of the economic opportunity uh, by establishing manufacturing capability and supply chains for battery cells and packs in India. And therefore, uh, right now, this is a huge opportunity for India to become a global uh, center for battery manufacturing. Uh, the third area I want to point out is uh, the rapid transformation that will take place through artificial intelligence. Uh, there's a, you know, there's a report by Accenture which Revive for Growth which forecasts that AI has the potential to boost India's growth by 1.3% by 2035. And, you know, this is about 957 billion or 15% of the gross uh, GVA uh, gross value added by 2035 and India you know has the potential because we have built up Aadhaar, we have built up unified payment interface, GST and Ayushman Bharat all this are of large size and scale and therefore they provide a massive opportunity and therefore uh, that's an area where we need to reorient our academic institutions, our IITs, triple IITs as centers of excellence producing data scientists and artificial intelligence managers of tomorrow. Now, the fourth uh, key area of transformation is, uh, is to my mind where India needs to uh, make a quantum jump is the fifth generation mobile technology network. And this will actually 5G will interconnect, uh, you know, it will radically transform the world of communication, mobile technologies and flow of data. Uh, we were late in exploring 2G, 3G and 4G technologies, but 5G will be another world. Uh, the user experience data rate will see a 10x jump. The spectrum efficiency will be 3x higher. The latency in milliseconds will be 10 times better. It will connect 10 lakh devices per kilometer square as compared to a mere 1 lakh in 4G. And it will drive internet of things. Uh, and therefore, uh, these four areas and I think the fifth area is genomics because uh, genomics will uh, will be a key to our understanding the structure of the genome including the mapping genes and sequencing of DNA and uh, last year the government launched the ND Gen project which will which, which gives the full genomes of over uh, thousand individuals are sequenced and the data handed over so there's a good case for the India Gen project to be upgraded into a national genome mission. And uh, therefore, I personally feel that these are five or five areas, according to me, which are critical for India's growth story as uh, disruption takes place around the world. Uh, I think we've already done some work around some new champion areas. We've uh, moved 
Uh, we've, uh, the government has announced a new scheme from mobile and electronic manufacturing where all value addition will be done in India. Uh, it looks at uh, you know, providing an incremental support for manufacturing beyond certain levels. Uh, we've come out with a new scheme for uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients and for medic, uh, pharmaceutical sectors. And we are working on new schemes for food processing, auto components. We are working on a new scheme for textiles, which we'll support, uh, where we support in creation of some global champions for India. So as I said, mobile manufacturing, medical devices, pharmaceutical textiles, we've done. Now we are working on auto and automobile and auto components, networking products, food processing, uh, battery storage, and solar PV manufacturing. Uh, our view is that, uh, you know, actually we built the backbone of digital payments. Uh, and actually, uh, if you look at uh, all these uh, uh, areas of, uh, you know, every second bank account which was built during, which was opened during 2014 and 2018, every second bank account was in India. So we have created the back end. And I think now we need to build the new structure on the basis of which we are able to do all transactions, all credit, all do paperless contract and build, uh, you know, world class products which are being built on India stack with open API and I think uh, digi lockers, push for UPI, push for payment apps, push for credit, push for transaction, uh, push, ensure that everybody gets a salary into his account through direct benefit transfer. And therefore, there's a huge opportunity uh, through uh, uh, payments, e-sign, digital lockers, uh, you know, uh, all these areas are massive, massive opportunities for India to make India a more efficient economy in the days to come. I think the other two areas which are very critical are healthcare and social and education, both in the digital world. Uh, we are building up 1,50,000 health and wellness centers. We are opening up more medical colleges. But this gives you a massive opportunity to create more doctors, but provide healthcare at the right price point. Similarly, opening up digital education in a much bigger way through our colleges and universities will be a critical challenge. Ensuring that we get huge investments in education and health from our private sector. This cannot be the job only of government, you need private sector. And to my mind, these are two sectors which with reforms will open up in a very big way. Uh, I also feel that uh, we've come out with new telemedicine guidelines. Uh, these are new areas of growth, completely new areas of growth of moving away from face-to-face -face consultation to online consultations and e-pharmacies. This will be completely new areas of growth. And uh, I think uh, what we've demonstrated is that working with private sector, we could create Arogya Setu. Uh, we've had over 90 million downloads till today. Uh, we have a massive opportunity, as I said, of, on artificial intelligence. And I think a huge amount of work needs to be done on data infrastructure, computing, adoption, research and development in the days uh, to come with the private sector. Uh, my belief is, uh, my belief always has been that uh, India has the possibility of becoming a leading nation uh, only if we are able to work with the private sector in sunrise areas of growth. Uh, I uh, am of the belief that while we were able to save lives, it's important to save livelihoods. The world of economy, the world of business will go through a massive, massive disruption in the days to come. And only those countries will emerge as winners, uh, which are able to handle new areas of uh, growth. Uh, this happened with Japan post-World War II. This happened with South Korea. And this has happened in recent times with China. They have got into new areas of growth. And that is what India needs to do. Uh, I, uh, I, I'm deliberately not touching on how low our growth will go. Definitely, we'll have lower growth. I have no doubt in my mind. But I think the important thing is that once we are able to handle this issue of uh, uh, the virus spreading from our main commercial cities, we should bounce back and bounce back with three shifts and get into completely. The challenge is not to do the same things. 
the challenge is to do in things intelligently and the challenge is to do things smartly and get into new areas of growth and that is what i've tried to point out in this presentation today